Okay, we just want to welcome all of you today, and we want to welcome all of our live streamers. We've got you streaming all the way across the world. So we've got Tennessee, Minnesota, California, Alabama, North Carolina, Virginia, Nevada, Texas, Georgia, New York, Florida, Colorado, Michigan, South Carolina, Illinois. And then we have some countries joining in. We have Gren Grenada, Barbados, and Kuwait. Can you just give them a hand? Welcome, welcome from all the way across the world. We are so glad that you are tuning in and joining us today. It's our honor and privilege for you to, to join in and be with us today. Well, today we've got somebody special in the house, Pastor Troy, if you were wondering. He's actually in Virginia Beach this weekend. He's uh, doing four services at a church there, and then he's doing some leadership training during the week this week, so he'll be coming back to us and be here for services next weekend. So be praying for him while he's there ministering. But we've always made it known and we've always said that what is happening here at Freedom House is not just about Charlotte, it's about reaching the world. So that's what he's doing. But we're also, we've brought in a little piece of the world with us today. We have Pastor Phil all the way from Sydney, Australia, who is here with us today. So we're pretty excited about that. For those of you who do not know Pastor Phil Pringle, he is a church planter and a church builder. He eats, sleeps, breathes church planting and church building. So I am just thrilled and honored that he is with us today to pour into us. So Freedom House Church, would you jump up on your feet? Would you give a big shout out and a cheer to Pastor Phil Pringle? Come on, people. Give Jesus a big hand there, will you? Bible says, clap your hands. All you people, shout to God with a voice. Whoa! Come on, shout to God with a voice. Let him know that Charlotte is alive. Well, they told me this was the best looking service in the entire church, and uh, it's bearing out true so far. Turn to your neighbor and say, hi, good looking. Apparently, we're making love pie in this church this morning. <laughs> Hi, live streamers. Glad to know that you're live and that you're streaming. It's an awesome thing to be in, uh, in Freedom House today with Troy and Penny Maxwell, two of the greatest pastors in the universe and uh, doing such a good job. I turn to my son, Daniel, who is with me all the way from Los Angeles. Stand up, Dan. Uh, he uh, is a... Uh, when I uh, come to America, I get the uh, joy of being able to travel with my boy. And uh, I have two sons, and they're both in Los Angeles. I live in Sydney, and my daughter works for me, Rebecca. And uh, she prints my books and does my, looks after my art and uh, various things like that. But as I said, it's such a joy to be with, with uh, Troy and Penny Maxwell. And I said to Daniel earlier on, my Lord, I think Penny could run her own church. And... Uh, and I think Troy said, well, she does. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, what a great preacher uh, you have. And just to see the high quality of all your, your disciples here, uh, people who are preaching and leading meetings and taking off, well, you know, apart from the taking offering guy, you know, like just everybody, such high quality. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm not sure if we, we come to church to make love pie. And uh, you just don't redeem it. You build on it, Penny. That's what you do. And uh, go for it. Uh, stretch it out. Make it for what it's worth. And uh, I'm, from, I'm from Sydney, Australia, and it's uh, a great joy to be here. Uh, we do plant a lot of churches. Uh, at present, it's about two per week. And uh, we're seeing hundreds of thousands of people coming to Christ uh, over the years and in our churches around the world. And it's, a, it's an incredible work that God has called us to, and we never feel adequate or prepared or qualified. But uh, apparently he uh, chooses the nobodies to do something. And so uh, I qualify on that score. And it's been a really great joyride for the last 45 years. Uh, we've been serving the Lord. I've been married for 44 years uh, to my beautiful wife, uh, Christine, who this morning is preaching in Dallas. Uh, when I said married for 44 years, that was an appropriate moment for you to say, no way. Uh, but uh, yeah, we married when she was four and uh, I was five. And so uh, 
No, I'm, uh, I'm 63, just to stop you thinking about other things while I'm preaching. And uh, another moment when you could have said, no way, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm setting you up here, people. And uh, you know, it takes a lot of money to look this good at this age. And uh, I had to work out for like six months before I came to this church. Like, it, 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 we're going to Freedom House. My God, they're all CrossFitters there or something. I, I got I to gotta sort of take steroids or do something to get myself ready. But uh, anyway, it didn't work. And uh, I did buy myself a membership at the gym. I know what you're thinking, get a refund. But uh, <laughs> the fact is we are uh, want, from Sydney. We have a great time, beautiful church in Sydney. And let me take you there just for a second uh, with this video. It'll give you a bit of background of uh, my context. Thanks very much if we could spin that video. Over these next few days, I am believing for you to have a massive revival, something unbelievable is going to happen in your world. We have a name that is above all. We have a name. We don't have to fail and we don't have to survive. We can thrive because there is still power in the name. There is only one begotten Son of the Father and His name is Jesus Christ. He did promise that it would happen. He didn't always say when. He didn't always say how. But he said it will happen. There is a fountain filled with blood. And it flows from Emmanuel's veins. This is the record that God has given unto us eternal life. And this life is in his son. I'm here today to bring the cross of Jesus Christ. He'll get you rising. Rising, rising, until you're floating on the current of the river of God. Woo! Yeah. So, uh, that's awesome. <laughs> just to let you know where we're from. And uh, we love you to come down and join us. Or you can watch it live streaming as well from uh, April 19 to 22nd. But uh, we believe in uh, that God, God lives in space. So in that conference, we give Him some. And uh, we just let the meetings breathe. Because in church, we're always time-bound. We do 30 services a weekend, so they're all pretty tight. And, uh, and so we need to just have time where people can soak and we only start the conference every day at one o'clock in the afternoon. So it's a real marriage reviver as well. You can sleep in and who knows what's going to happen. You can make love pie. You know, it's just like, uh, it'd be an amazing thing. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's good. Getting hot in here. Are you, are you warm? Uh, yeah, well, it's, uh, yeah, we also have a, uh, have a college, an online college with, uh, about 6,000 students right now, and uh, we've graduated out of our on-site Bible college, nearly around 10,000 leaders who are planning churches and in doing stuff all around the world. And so, uh, but you're welcome to uh, take that up if, you, if you'd like to be getting some kind of teaching, training. I'm sure you get plenty here as well, and, uh, but that's, that's another option. I wanted to talk just before I start, uh, to, because as we get to the end, I, I may not get a chance, just about these three books. I got several books out there. Uh, I've written 14, and so I think we have maybe half of them out there. Uh, today, I'm going to be speaking about the born identity, and we'll talk about that shortly. Uh, this morning and last night, I spoke out of this book, Faith, and uh, I, there are some core values that I have and build on. I think you always got to build on your revelation and build on your core value. And, uh, uh, and, and generally, you, you know a lot more about the thing that you don't have so much of. You know, like the Apostle John, he's the Apostle of love, but he's the guy who wanted to call fire out of heaven on people. So the thing he lacked the most is what he learned the most about. And man, you know, I, I really need a lot of faith for what we do. And so I wrote as much as I could about that, studied it. And, uh, and when, you, when you get a hold of faith in your life, you become like a conducting rod for the power of God just to touch your world and put you on a, a, a pathway that collides with miracles. And you know, uh, every meeting I go into, I believe something supernatural is going to happen. I don't believe in just having church where we warm the seat. 
God comes to church too, you know. And He doesn't come to do nothing. He doesn't come to just sit on a seat and listen to a sermon. He comes to actually touch you and to do things. This is the gate of heaven. Uh, that's what Jacob said. Uh, this, I mean, he came to a place that was called Luz, L-U-Z, which means house of nuts. And uh, a lot of people come to church and they think, wow, there's a house of nuts, you know. But uh, it eventually, he changed the name of it when he met with God there to the house of God. And, and you can come into a place like this, this is a place of nuts, you know, but then when you encounter God, you say, no, this is, this is the gate of heaven. How awesome is this place? And the gate of heaven is where heaven comes into earth and earth goes into heaven. And so we need to put as many gates of heaven on earth as we possibly can, because this is where you are going to be transported out of this earthly zone into, into the heavenly zone. And that's why worship is so important. Not just to stand there and watch them on the stage, but actually to enter in because these guys are empowering you with songs in your soul that'll sing themselves all through the week. And so you go out equipped with worship in your heart and you're able to actually be a worshiper all week long. And then uh, another book that I got here, I love talking about this book because Easter is coming and uh, like two weeks away. And I preached this message at Easter about 10 years ago in our church. And it was because I read the passage, they crucified him, but God raised him from the dead. So, and then I thought, I wonder how many times, but God is in the scripture. And I found it's in there 65 times. Joseph said to his brothers, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Yeah, and I, I mean, I preached the whole 65 in my church and Everybody did exactly what you do, but God. And for six months afterwards, everybody's walking around saying, but God. And I've got to tell you, if this, if, this is the but you need in your life, <laughs> right? I know a lot of us are trying to get a little less but, but you want more of this but. You want a big but. You want a big but God in your world. There are some people who are very hard work people. You say it's a nice day and they go, yeah, but you know, it's like, you know, they're hard work and you want to give up before you even get going because they're just going to argue with you. Yeah, but, yeah, but. You need a buttectomy if that's your, your problem <laughs> to, get, to get rid of that butt. But this is the butt you need to get a hold of in your life, the butt of God. It needs to be in your life because that butt, when it comes in, it brings a God factor into your life. But let me get on to this because I'm so excited to share this message. It's like, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Thank you, Jesus, for touching this word. Engage our hearts, inject faith, and build us in the Spirit of God in Jesus' name. And everybody said, bless Troy too, Lord, wherever he is today. Amen. And look after him in Virginia, that's right, in that great church there. Amen. Okay, I want you to come with me to James 1 verse 22. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his face, his natural face in a mirror. He observes himself, goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Can you say that with me? This one will be blessed in what he does. I want you to say it with attitude this time. This one will be blessed in what he does. One more time. This one will be blessed in what he does. I love that. That means that there are some who don't get blessed in what they do. They work hard, but nothing much happens. It feels like their wheels are spinning. They're busy, but they got no traction. They got no momentum. It's treading water, biding time. That can happen in marriage. It can happen in family. It can happen in your business can happen in church life. But a person who is blessed gets momentum. Things begin to progress. Things get upgraded. Things move forward. Things enlarge. Things get blessed and increase happens. And so James is saying, the one who does not forget, 
who they are, they will be blessed in what they do. That's the person who gets blessed, who does not forget who they are. If you do not forget who you are, you will be blessed in what you do. But it's easy to forget who we are because we look into the Bible and we see it, but then we go into our realities, our circumstances, and they seem to be sending us a different message. And we suffer immediate Christian amnesia. Amnesia is a common theme of, of movies. All over the, you know, like all over the world, we see these movies on the theme of, Christ, oh, not Christian, just amnesia. And uh, I, I Googled it just to see how many movies have been made on the theme of amnesia. There's 129. I don't know if you can remember some of them, but uh, there's uh, Char, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. We've got some pictures of these guys up there uh, on Total Recall. And then you got Memento with Guy Pearce. You've got Dark City, uh, Director's Cut. You've got 50 First Dates with Adam Sandler. Sounds like hell. Uh, yeah, yeah. You've got The Long Kiss Goodnight where Gina Davis is a frumpy housewife, but then she suddenly finds that she's got skills. When she awakens to who she really is, she's an assassin. She can shoot a gun and she can... Kill people, you know, and then obviously the Bourne identity, and that's what I named this book after, where you got Jason Bourne who takes a knock to the head and forgets who he is. And a lot of believers take a knock to the head and forget who they are, get dislodged from their place of victory and start to fit their circumstances into Scripture rather than the Scripture into their circumstances. Try to conform in the Word of God to their circumstances and to their mindset rather than to what God has actually said they are. Who do we think we are? Who do you think you are? The Bible says in Ephesians 2.10, we are His workmanship. That word means His work of art. You are a work of art in God's thinking. There's once upon a time, before you were even born, God thought about you. He thought, man, I love to have one of those. He thought of you. It was like a spark coming out of His mind. Oh, man, I'd love to have one of those. I haven't got one of those. I'm going to make me one of those. And now here you are. You've turned up. He gave you self-aware consciousness. That's a bit too deep for Sunday morning if we go there. Because you're here. And you know you're you and I know I'm me. And I know I'm not you and you know you're not me. Where did that come from? That's a created self-aware personality. That you can say, I am. Your cat can't say that. But you can. Because you've got... Godness in you. You have the image of God, which can say, I am. Jesus constantly referred to his identity. I am the bread of life. I am the door. I am the way, the truth, the life. I am. He understood who he was and refused to forget who he was. So he constantly stated who he was to himself after the Father had said, You are my beloved son. We live in an age of identity theft where people feel like they don't know who they are. They're, they're trying to wear the mask of another person just to try and shape up and be accepted in the world. But I got to tell you that God wanted you as you are. You're beautiful just as you are. He said, that's what I want. And you're an expert at at least one thing in this life, and that's being you. Nobody else can be you like you can be you. And He has made you to be loved and to love. And so to understand this is who I am, a child of God, not a grandchild. If you're a Christian child, you know, you're in a Christian family, you are a direct descendant of the Father. You're not like a second generation Christian. There's only first generation believers. You're a direct descendant. He is your father and you are his child, his daughter, his son. We are his workmanship made in his image. Before I was going to be a preacher, I was going to be an artist. And so I went to the School of Fine Arts in Christchurch, New Zealand. And uh, I'd been a hippie and searching for truth. I dropped out of art school, which is quite an achievement because art school's pretty low level, you know, kind of thing. And <laughs> it's kind of drop out. Well, I did it. And, and I had to study art history. And one of the things we studied was the Sistine Chapel ceiling and, uh, and Michelangelo's works of art. And we would read about Michelangelo's ideas about God were that he was dark and withdrawn and not really extroverted and out, out loud. And he, he had these muted colors. But then about 10 years ago, the Vatican employed 
a Japanese firm to restore the fresco on the ceiling of the Vatican of the Sistine Chapel. And, and so they went up there and with a very delicate solution started to suck out all the impurities that had, had discolored the fresco. And they found that the candles from the, 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 the chapel's activities had sent up this wax and soot into the fresco and had completely dulled all the colors. So all, what all the historians were saying was not actually accurate. And if you have a look at this, that's what it started like. And that's what it finished like. So they found that no Michelangelo was not trying to portray God as dull and in the background and boring and not really out there. They were, he was using the most brilliant colors you could possibly find. But let me tell you this, the smoke of religion over the centuries has gone up into our ideas about who God is and has reflected back into who we are. And we've got a totally wrong view of, our, of the Father. God is a party animal. He is like the most fun person you could hang out with. We think he's this most serious person. And in in, you know, like uh, I did a, a message recently on lifting up your eyes. And we have this view that God is so severe and so frowning on us that we all, we got the statement in religious circles, bow your head and close your eyes. Do you know how many times that's in the Bible? Zero. It's not there once. Do you know how many times? Lift up your head. It's, not, it's numerous times. Can you imagine running into your father's room, into the living room? Say, Daddy, Daddy. And he goes, bow your head, close your eyes. <laughs> like, what's that about? We've come into his house. This is the father's house. Every church is the father's house. This is his home. He didn't care. Come, come in here. Hey, bow your heads, close your eyes. Don't you realize I'm a holy God? Tremble and be afraid. Be very, very afraid. I'm in the house. No, it's not like that. His arms are wide open. It's the New Testament. The Old Testament, stay away. New Testament, come unto me. Jesus is coming to me. Oh, you're weary and heavy laden. I'll give you rest. I'm going to give you. I mean, God is fun. And as He is, the Bible says, as He is, so are we in this world. That's in 1 John 4, 17. As He is, so are we in this world. The way you see God is the way you're going to become. We reflect the nature of the God we behold. And that's why Christians are so horribly boring sometimes. We go like, my God, do I have to come to this place and be in this? Oh, but no, I don't have to be one of those people, do I? You know, I love Jesus, but God saved me from His disciples. It's like, <laughs> to be in heaven, it's going to be glory. But to be down here with the saints, that's another story. It's, it's like, I'm not sure. I really want to. When I got born again, I didn't know if I would really want to hang out with that crowd. They were so old-fashioned for a start. They were like, it just seemed like they, they, and they all had withdrawn from every segment of society. We were just this funny little group all looking inside. So, and and it, didn't, it just seemed so unartistic. I like art was from the devil it almost and music's from the devil and like politics and entertainment. And, I mean, it's like everything. It was just us few little people who are kind of holy or something. And, and that's weird, man. That's so weird. We're meant to be salt in the midst of the world, light to the world. I mean, if you see God as, as severe and, and dull, that's what you're going to be like. If you're boring, would you just stop it? Just stop. Stop. You are not created a boring person. When was the last time you danced? Come on, old guys. When was the last time you just danced around? Singing in the shower. You know, you're grumping around the house trying to be this severe Christian. Forget it. God made giraffes. Why would he waste all that power making giraffes? That, what did they do? They don't, you don't see them pulling a cart. They don't have giraffe races. Did you ever have a giraffe burger? You don't eat them. What do they do? They're nothing. It's just fun. God's making things, making a horse. He says, let's try one with a long neck. You know, it's like, <laughs> stretch it out. Turtles. There's a rock. Let's put a head and some legs on it. They're like, <laughs> he had so much fun. They was laughing all day long. <laughs> Make a big one. You know, it's like, 
Too much fun. I don't know if you, I'm a creative person. I love creating. It's fun. It's not a horrible experience. It's a joyful, beautiful celebration of life. Jesus is walking on water. Why did he get a boat? What are you using all that power for just walking on water, Jesus? That's fun. What's the purpose of walking on water? A wow factor. That's what we go. Wow. Wow's enough. Wow is enough for God. That's wonder. It's worship. So Peter says, can I do that? Well, we'd say, well, have you done a Bible course on this? Water walking. It's a pretty rough day. Do you want to choose a calmer day for your water walking? What's your, what's your motivation here, Peter? You know, really, why do you want to do this? Is it like selfish ambition or, you know, like nothing like that. Jesus says, yeah, yeah, come on. It's fun. Shallow up a little, people. Amen. It's, have, some, have some joy and fun in the kingdom of God. Understand that you're a, you're a real human. You're not just a sterile uh, human. You're not somebody who's, who had to cut their personality off when they came through the door. Used to paint the town red. Now you paint it beige. It's, <laughs> it's like the Christians are meant to be the most wonderful, glorious people on the entire planet. And, and when I met Jesus, I needed a hit because I'd had some pretty wild experiences before I met Jesus. You smoke some interesting substances. You know, you, you kind of, you, you're like, like and, and, and take some interesting medication. You know, I was a, a pilot for Roche, who were a chemical company. And uh, I, I, I you, you kind of fly a little high. You know, but so when I met Jesus, I needed a little more than just a religious service and you read the Bible and you start on this life track and you, you know, I needed something to impact me and he sure did. I got carried away. When was the last time you got carried away in the presence of the Lord? When was the last time you got embraced and soaked and touched, released into that presence of the Most High God? You know, there is an ache on the inside of us, every one of us, that we would be clothed with something more than we actually are. And I believe it's reflected in the movies. It's reflected in uh, a lot of the, 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 the movies that we, we have today, like uh, as soon as they put on their suit, they're transformed, like Superman. He goes into the telephone booth, puts on his clothes, cape, puts his underpants on the outside of his pants, and <laughs> suddenly he can fly. I've tried it. It didn't work, you know, like, you can be Spider-Man, put on your, hey, boy, you're doing all sorts of stuff from even Ant-Man. You become a little guy now, and uh, you got great power. You, you become, uh, Jackie Chan puts on a tuxedo. He can walk on the ceiling. I mean, as soon as I've got something on them, they're clothed in something, and that's what we are in Christ. The ancient prediction of the Garden of Eden was that when Adam and Eve sinned, God slew a lamb, two lambs. He made a sacrifice for their sin and then He clothed them with the skin of the sacrifice. They were clothed with sheepskin. And that's exactly us in the New Testament. We are clothed with the skin of the sacrifice. Christ died, but now we are in Him. 147 times in the New Testament it says, in Him. That's your position in Christ. So when you are clothed, when you are in Him, Jesus introduced the principle in John 15. Abide in me and I in you. Because that's where, where all of us are destined to be. And that ache to be clothed with something that will make us extraordinary is reflected, I think, in the subconscious of many movie makers when they, they present us with this idea that you can get inside something. Like Avatar was pretty good, where the guy who couldn't even walk gets inside this creature and he's like twice the height. He still looks a bit like him. He can walk on other planets. He's, he's a different guy. But my most favorite one of all the the Supermans, the Spider-Mans, is the Iron Man. Now you can fly, you can shoot missiles off your shoulder. Anything the devil fires at you, ping, off it goes. You are in Christ. Without Him, you are naked. With Him, in Him. So as you centralize your life around Jesus and you put yourself in Christ and speak it, I live in Christ. As I said, 147 statements about being in Christ in the New Testament. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, we are in Christ, new creations in Christ Jesus. Anyone who's in Christ is a brand new species of being, the Amplified Bible says. And once you were like 
bearing the image of earth, now you bear the image of heaven. 1 Corinthians 15, 49 says, as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. So quickly, just, just going on, I wanna give you two out of those 147 uh, deals that relate to you and me as being in Christ. The first is that in Christ, you are an overcomer. Oh, I get so excited about talking about this because... There's a lot of times when you have prayed a prayer and it doesn't seem to get answered. You ever had one of those? Put your hand up if you ever had one of those. Yeah, I know. Oh, what are we going to do about this? It's like we thought prayer works. Does it not work or does it work? Or, but you know, there are sometimes the answer to your prayer is strengthen your soul so that you can live above your unresolved circumstance rather than get the miracle. The first half of Hebrews 11 is about Daniel, shut the mouths of lions, brought down cities, escaped the violence of the sword, get walked through the fire. But a lot of us just stop. When you get to the second half of Hebrews chapter 11, the lions ate them. They were burned in the fire. They didn't get their prayers answered, but it says they all were living in faith. And sometimes faith is about living above your unresolved circumstance, as much as it is about getting the, the circumstance resolved. Even Paul prayed a prayer three times. God, I want to get rid of this thing. There's something that bugs me in my life. And God said, you can live above it. You're an overcomer. You cannot be an overcomer unless you've got something to overcome. And if you're going to live under your circumstances, you're always going to be the person who's never that overcomer. But an overcomer smiles in spite of their circumstances. That is the great secret of being a Christian. Even though I got no fig tree on the fig tree, even, uh, figs on the fig tree, even though I got no herd in the stall and no, no fruit on the vine, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. My circumstances are not going to dominate my life. Your life is never going to be perfect. If somebody told you that being a Christian is going to be like going to Disneyland, just rides and happiness and sweet flowers and sweet confectionery all day long, they sold you the wrong bill of goods. Following Jesus was never going to be easy. If you wanted an easy one, you shouldn't have become a Christian. Plenty of other religions around. But this one is going to call from you the greatest and the highest of your qualities. And to live this life, you got to live in Christ as an overcomer. In Jesus' name, pick up your cross, follow me, and you're going to find yourself living in the victory that isn't a resolved circumstance every time, but it's living in victory in spite of that unresolved situation. I know it's probably not what you wanted to hear. You wanted to hear that God's going to, He's going to like, like, I don't know, Zap my husband with a bolt of lightning and I'll be able to get a new one, you know, or uh, he's going to take my kids or uh, I'm going to, something weird like that. But God doesn't answer those prayers. You got to actually move into another gear. Don't be a one-dimensional Christian who's only just looking for miracles and handouts. Change gear, stand up and say, I'm going to put my suit on today. I'm going to walk out of here in Christ. I can face my world. I can do this in Jesus' name. As you change your confession, you'll find yourself walking in victory. And so one of, the, one of the most amazing things is discovering who you really are because of a trial. And that's what happens in those people that suffered amnesia. Jason Bourne suddenly discovered when he got into a problem that he had skills. He could fight. He didn't know he could. You know, when an eagle is going to have its little eaglet, it goes up into a ledge on a, like a thousand foot cliff, picks out these branches and thorns and leaves and soft feathers and stuff and, and then sits in the nest and lays an egg. Sits on the egg, egg cracks open eventually. Mother flies around getting worms and rats. It's eating this, it grows, gets bigger. One day, Mother Eagle comes peering down at a little eaglet and it looks like mum's gone crazy. Her eyes are cross-eyed. She starts pulling the nest apart, wrecks the house. The little bird's home is gone. It's standing on the little ledge thinking, where are we going to live, ma? 
Then mother looks really crazy. Her head goes on the side. She goes, Phew! hits the little bird across the ledge. And the birds go ah! out to the edge of the cliff, hanging over the edge now. Mother's looking down at this little bird hanging on the edge of a cliff, looks down with the craziest look of all. It goes, boom, pushes that little bird off the ledge. Birds go dum, 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 all the way down. Ah, mother, you're killing me. What are you doing in my life? Like, flapping and flying around with this wing. Then, whoo, whoo. Suddenly, she says, I didn't know I could do that. Didn't know that could happen. Didn't know I could live above my problem. Didn't know I could live in this world and be happy. Didn't know I could actually escape this difficulty. Didn't know I could actually fly like that. If you don't forget who you are, you will be blessed in what you do. Throughout the Bible, there are a lot of people who forgot who they were. The Israelites, Kadesh Barnea, Gideon, the prodigal son. But there is one guy who didn't forget who he was. His name is Joseph. Got a dream when he's like 17. The dream was that he would live like a king. Romans 5.17 5, says, rule like kings in life in Christ Jesus. All those who are in Christ shall reign in life. So when you start walking in scriptures like this, you will find that no matter what your circumstances are, you can live a blessed life. If you don't forget who you are, you'll be blessed in what you do. So he had this dream of being a king, of ruling in life. But then his brothers turned against him. They hated him. They tried to kill him, but then they decided they'd sell him, make some money out of him. So they sold him as a slave. And along came the slave traders and they chained him and shackled him. And all of the people in the slave chain were stumbling along. But there's one character who didn't walk like the rest of them. He walked tall. In fact, he looked like royalty. He was Joseph. He was a product of his future, not a product of his past or his present. He could see who he was going to be, so he walked like that person in his present. And eventually, the richest man in town said, I want him. Purchased him. Potiphar was his name. Everything this man touched got blessed. Because if you don't forget who you are, what you do will be blessed. It got blessed and blessed, and he rose and rose. Only trouble was is Potiphar's wife, she wanted to make some love pie. And... Uh, Huh? So she grabbed, reached out to grab Joseph, and he ran, leaving his coat in her hands. He had trouble keeping his coats, this boy. So she's screaming, he tried to force me all through the, the household. Who was going to believe a Hebrew slave? He was thrown into prison. In prison, you'd think that he'd say, oh, what an idiot I am, thinking that I'd ever amount to anything in life. Here I am in a strange land. My family hates me. My family rejected me. I've, I've been lied about. I was innocent. And it's unjust. It's unfair. I should, I should just develop one big victim cancer and, and feel like I'm going to die right here. In this. You think that's how he's going to be, but he doesn't. He says, you know what? I'm going to be a product of my vision. I can see myself. I'm a king. And he walked like royalty around that prison. You know what happened? Everything he touched got blessed. If you don't forget who you are, you'll be blessed in what you do. And as he walked around that prison, as he walked around that prison, he became the highest guard in the entire prison. He was overseeing everything. Eventually, one day, the king had a dream that he couldn't understand, couldn't even remember the dream. And I was told that this guy, Joseph, he understands how to interpret dreams. He says, well, let's call him up. Joseph comes to the palace and stands before the king and he's able to interpret other people's dreams. That's Joseph's thing. And the king says, well, that's amazing. And then Joseph gives them some counsel. Counsel that just took five minutes but made Egypt the richest nation in the world. Instantly, the king said, come on, sit at my right hand. Put this ring on your finger. You can stamp any contract, make any negotiation, any... And you can pay for anything with that stamp. I give you complete authority, like a prime minister, like a king in this nation. In a day, he went from the prison to the palace. 
if you don't forget who you are, eventually those unresolved circumstances are going to get resolved. That dream is trying to come to pass in your life if you will not forget and forsake who you are. And the fact is all of us have moments where we get that amnesia. We forget who we are. If I could have our keyboard player come, that'd be great. You know, while you're running your race, it's like there are moments where it seems like it's not gonna happen. That dream you had about your business, that dream you had about your family, that dream you had as a child, that thing that has never left you, something's gonna happen eventually. But then it's taken too long and you start to, you start to stagger. It. But you know, the Bible says we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. The image is that we're running a race in the Olympic Stadium. And you're running this race, and you think it's taken so long. <clears throat> but you look up into the stadium, and there's all these shouts. And there's this one guy up there with a long white beard. You look up there, and you say, who is that? He says, it's Noah. Don't think it's taken too long. It took me 120 years to get that promise fulfilled. You've only been gone 30 years so far. You've got another, like, 90 years to go. And you know you haven't, but anyway. He says, don't be discouraged. It will come to pass. You're running along there, and you, you feel like there are all these wild animals, people trying to devour you, trying to swallow you up, take your money, kill your world. There's a guy up there, very regal-looking person. He said, who are you? He said, Daniel. Listen, the lions won't eat you. Keep running. Don't stop. Don't, don't give up right now. And then you look up and there's this guy we've just been talking about. And you're thinking, I've been lied about. I've been badly treated. All these things, I, I should just give up right now. But there's a guy up there called Joseph. He says, come on, Phil. Come on, don't you feel bad about the haters? Don't you feel bad about the, the other guys who are all coming against you? Don't feel bad about the people who sell you for a dime. Don't feel bad about that. Eventually the dream will come to pass. But you need to know, people, here this morning, that when you look up into that stand, there is one voice that's louder than every other voice. And He's looking at you and you think, I've been buried. I've been locked up in a tomb. There's a stone over my shoulder. There's a thing that I'm feeling like I'm dead. And it is Jesus Himself and He's saying, don't you give up because even if you are dead, you're going to come out of that black hole in three days in victory. You're going to stand up and you're going to run with me to the finish line. There is no way that you are going to stay in the tomb. There is no way you're going to stay in the ground. You are not going to stay dead. There is a victory for those who will not forget who they are in Jesus' Name. Come on, give the Lord a clap offering. Let's all stand up here. If I could have the whole band, the whole band, if they could come. Oh, Jesus, we thank You. Lord, we give You praise here in this house while we're standing. Before we close the service, can I ask one question? Those of you who have never actually invited Jesus into your life, He only comes by invitation. He will not force His way in. He needs you to say, come into my heart, Lord. Please, nobody move. I'm only going to take two minutes. If you've never done that, here this morning, I want you to say, Jesus, come into my life. Come into my heart. In a couple of moments, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. I want you to put it up high so I can see and we'll pray for you. Some of you have been away from God. You need to come back. I want you to come back right here, right now, today. I want you also to put your hand up when I ask. Some of you are not sure you're going to heaven. You hope you are. You think you are. But you're not sure. If I said, are you going to heaven? You'd say, I'm a good person. But that's not what gets us in. It's Christ in your life. So I want you also to put your hand up. If you're not sure you're going to heaven, can I ask all of us in this room to close our eyes? And if that's you, my friend, if you've never invited Jesus to come into your life, never prayed that prayer, or if you've been away from God and you need to come back, or if you're just not sure you're going to heaven, wherever you are in this building, in a couple seconds, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand. If that's you, you're gonna say, I want Jesus in my life, I'm coming back. I wanna make sure I'm going to heaven. Right now, put your hand in the air. Put it up high for me. 
Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Right up the back, I see your hands. Okay, can, I, can you look this way, people? Those of you who raise your hands, I want you to do something brave for me. I want you to walk out of the aisle. Come down here. I want to shake your hand and pray for you. Will you just come right now? Just come. Come right now. Come right now. Is there? there are other people here. Come. Now's your time. Just step out of your seat. Say, now, I need to be down there. You know you do. Reach out and say, today I'm going to meet Jesus. I'm going to have Christ come into my life. Just step out. Come on. Now's the time. Now is salvation. Now is your moment. It's a war for your soul. Come now. Step out of your seat. You know you should be down here. You know it's your time. You know it's your destiny. Come on. Don't stay there. Move out of your seat. Move out of your place and say, Today, I'm getting saved. Today, I'm getting born again. Today, I'm receiving Christ into my life. One more call. Come. Before we pray, come now. Now is your moment. Welcome this lady as she comes. There are other people coming. Hi. Come on, welcome these people. There are more here. There's another five people here. Come, welcome this lady as she comes. There's other people coming. Come. Now is your moment. Now is your time. Moved by the Holy Spirit. Say, God, touch these lives. Bring salvation to their soul. If there's one more soul, I need you to come right now. Come, step out of your seat. If you got a friend, say, let's go down and get some prayer. Just step out. Just say, today's our day. I want you to come now. Step out. Do not stay where you are. Say, today, I want to get born again. In Jesus' name. All you guys, I'm so proud of you. Say, man, why was your name? Charles. Great. Hi, what's your name? Brittany. Why are you crying, Brittany? You okay? You're going to be just fine. We're going to make this prayer. You're going to be fine. Hey, young guys. How are you? So glad you came. Pleased to meet you. Pleased to meet you. Pleased to meet you. God bless you. I'm so thrilled to meet you. You're their mother? this point we're going to pray a prayer I want you to make it your prayer I'm just going to help you with it close your eyes could you I'm not going to ask you to bow your head you can lift it if you like uh, the reason I'm asking you to close your eyes is so you can focus it's your prayer not mine can you say these words to God after me dear God in heaven let's try that again dear God in heaven I ask Jesus Christ to come into my life I ask to be born again. I repent from sin. Forgive me. Cleanse me. Make me your child. Help me follow Jesus. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Thank you, God, for saving me. Amen.